thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, we are recording this session um, and uh, you'll get a link to the recording um, uh, in a couple of days once we've processed it um, and a copy of the slides afterwards and you can uh, then uh, share those with colleagues that um, aren't able to join us live or uh, remind yourselves of, uh, of what we were talking about uh, later. Um, we do want this to be um, uh, interactive as much as possible. We do welcome questions. Um, please feel free to use the chat function um, and um, we'll either uh, answer them um, as we go along if we can or we'll pick them up um, uh, questions and discussion uh, at the end. Um, so, um, few um, introductions and, and run through of what we're going to do this afternoon. So I'm Tim Rivett. Uh, I am your um, compare for um, this afternoon um, and I run Artig on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. Um, I will give you a bit of uh, introduction and background to, uh, to, to the idea behind uh, today's session. Um, we're then going to hear from Pete from Perspective. Um, we've got um, Dan from Basemap, um, and we've got Aidan and Mark from EPM, um, and we've got Craig and John from Optibus, who are going to um, talk to us about um, what they do as uh, organisations and uh, and the state of art um, for um, uh, planning. Um, public transport networks um, and we will uh, wrap up with questions and a bit of a discussion about um, where where the industry might go next with uh, with with planning so um, for those of you that are new to Artig um, we're a membership body for public transport technology stakeholders um, encompassing everybody from um, suppliers to bus operators and authorities and, and government um, departments in between. Um, and we um, run events like this, face-to-face um, -face ones as well. Um, we develop best practice guidance and advice um, on how to implement um, technology um, in public transport context. Um, and we develop and help develop um, technical standards. So um, things like Siri, we were heavily involved in, traffic light priority, those sort of technical um, standards. Um, a lot of those have been uh, developed um, either directly through Artig or, uh, or with our um, involvement. So um, if you want to find out more about us, details will be um, uh, on screen at the end of the session. So um, this afternoon, um, we're going to um, think about um, planning public transport. Um, and um, this sort of came, came about because over the last few months, there's been, well, over the last year, really, there's been an awful lot of um, people talking about the need to um, change the way um, transport networks are configured, uh, plan new routes um, in light of COVID um, and things like the uh, Bus Back Better National Bus Strategy, um, where um, for those of you that, uh, that can remember what it says uh, a year on or so after its launch, um, it talks quite a lot about the buses that we want, the sort of things that people um, want out of bus services. Um, and the expectation from the strategy is that there'll be more frequent services, they're going to be faster and more reliable, um, and they're going to be more comprehensive. They're going to um, operate in the evenings and weekends. Um, and um, that is inevitably going to need an awful lot of planning um, and um, incremental changes. Is this possible? Is that possible? 
Um, and so uh, the people we've got this afternoon um, are the uh, are the sort of companies that are going to be able to uh, to help with with a lot of those um, sort of ideas and concepts um, and help you um, plan your routes um, within um, bus service improvement plans. So the the bit that delivers the bus strategy, which you will have all have submitted your uh, for those of you that are authorities, plans to the DFT uh, a few months ago now. Um, that does set out how you get access to some of the data that you might need for planning services. So um, enables access to um, things like um, patronage, timing data, um, and uh, performance data as well. Um, so um, through um, enhanced partnerships and the bus service improvement plans, you should um, start to be able to get access to data uh, if you haven't got it already um, and work with operators to um, plan and look at services and networks. Um, the other thing that we should um, factor in um, when we're thinking about um, planning is is the impact that COVID um, and the recovery from it is having. Um, patronage has been up and down over the last um, few years as lockdowns have, have come and gone. Um, things are improving um, again at the moment, um, but we're still um, figures uh, from last week. Um, still at somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of pre-pandemic levels, depending on quite where you are in the country and um, uh, route. Um, so significantly below what they were, certainly significantly um, lower revenues as a result of that. Um, and um, what routes and networks will be able to be run in future um, in light of you know, levels that before Christmas, before Omicron started to uh, to play havoc, were still you know only sort of somewhere between eighty and ninety percent. Um, you know that for a lot of routes will wipe out profit um, and um, reliance on high frequency commuter office based type. Um, commuting in the mornings and, and evenings um, might well have gone because more people are working more flexibly, um, certainly uh, from in offices and things like that. Um, and to add into that, um, the future funding, um, the uh, the COVID recovery funds um, due to end at the end of um, March um, and um, even with um, bus service improvement plan funding and things like that, quite how much money is going to be available for public transport services um, remains to be seen. So um, there's going to be a lot of replanning of um, routes and networks as a result of um, funding challenges um, over the next couple of years, no doubt, as well. Um, so in light of um, that we thought it would be sensible to look at what the state of the art is. Um, Pete published some um, article um, in Coach and Bus um, just before Christmas, um, which seemed to, uh, to, to to be quite timely um, and uh, and say some interesting things about the the state of the art, um, and so. Um, we're going to um, hear from uh, from Pete from perspective um, first. So welcome, Pete. Thanks, Tim. Um, good to be here. Really good to be here. And um, uh, looking forward to the discussion. Right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as Tim has said, um, uh, we they, you know, there's huge numbers of challenges around network planning at the moment. And I, I'm sure that by the time uh, 
Uh, the four sets of speakers have spoken, and you'll be left in no doubt about all the problems there are, all the challenges there are for, for operators and authorities to, to plan the future of bus networks. Um, uh, so I thought what I'd do, just, just quickly introduce ourselves um, as a company for those that don't know us, and then talk a little bit about what we have, have been doing around network planning over the years and, and, and the way in which we're addressing the, the challenges as they stand. So, um, uh, Perspective is uh, uh, about five years old. Uh, we uh, span out of uh, University College London from a department that was uh, bringing together people from different uh, disciplines, not just transport modeling, but economics, uh, uh, demography and so forth, to try and build um, digital replicas of the way in which cities uh, uh, operate, the kind of dynamics of cities, kind of a broader, broader conceptualization around uh, transport modeling. And so we've always had a kind of mindset around thinking about the, the broader context in which um, any individual decisions are being made um, within a for, for a given fleet or a given operator. A lot of our work is in the bus industry, um, but we're using tools that look at the wider uh, transport network when um, uh, when delivering any of our, our services. And so one of the big things that, that we see is, uh, you know, in our DNA is, is really thinking about how individual services uh, can be better coordinated with uh, the way in which the city is functioning. So we've built software um, and provide services to operators and authorities across the UK, uh, primarily used um, around the network planning and scheduling processes uh, to try and increase punctuality of services, uh, to try to reduce the level of resource uh, required to deliver a given service design and to try and get the best matching between the design of the supply um, and the way in which demand is changing. Um, and as I'm sure will come up today, understanding customer demand um, at the moment is both challenging but also really critical. Um, so we've we've done work um, uh, over the years that has meant that we've built a a very broad uh, representation of the what you might call the multimodal transport network across the UK. We started off uh, working for central government departments like the Treasury and National Infrastructure Commission, uh, building out uh, kind of UK wide representation of the public transport network. Um, so our, our systems are being used to understand kind of, kind of national uh, wide infrastructure uh, challenges, infrastructure questions. So National Infrastructure Commission are using it to understand the connectivity of different communities. Um, and the reason that's kind of important uh, for us now in the transit industry is that it was built up from schedules, it was built up from time specific information. Uh, so we now have uh, a kind of resource that enables us to look at uh, how the actual accessibility for uh, for passengers is changes by time of day based on a kind of really detailed picture of supply that's consistent across the country. Um, so we've we've kind of elaborated that 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 capability, built it out to a software system. Um, that uses the kind of fleet uh, telemetry, the kind of the, the GPS data, the, the information coming from the vehicles themselves, uh, all the customer data coming from the ticketing devices, a lot of contextual data uh, to support core planning and operations processes for, for transit operators. The services are being used up and down the country um, with kind of apps to help customers um, understand uh, future vehicle occupancy through to systems that help uh, help redesign and rethink the way in which the, the the network should should be should be run. Today, I'm I'm, I'm going to be obviously talking about the, the planning side of things. Uh, now, I don't want to labour this point because Tim has already given a very good introduction to to what's happening at the moment. But we know that um, ridership change is you know, the the big thing in the room uh, for operators at the moment. Uh, you know, in spite of um, the, the the positive messaging and some positive actions around um, funding, there's still fundamentally a big challenge for commercial operators uh, when ridership has changed so fundamentally. Um, and when it comes to network planning, that raises challenges around, you know, how do you maintain and protect services, let alone um uh increase the supply of public transport in certain areas and also how do you start to plan when there's such uncertainty um i think one of the things that's uh, on top of people's mind at the moment is you know how do you make effective decisions when the future is so uncertain 
Um, so what I'm just going to go through is really our approach to tackling this problem and, and, and the kinds of tools we bring to bear. So I think um, there are some kind of sub questions to this, this problem around how you design a network that are probably coming up quite a lot and we hear a lot in our conversations. So one is, is very much driven by demand. So you know, how, how can you best align your routes and, and your service frequencies to match how demand is changing? Um, and and where, where should the network change in order to reflect the ways in which passengers are changing their travel behavior? Um, demand responsive transport is a big part of that as well, because um, obviously it's very close to the core transit provision, but it's seen as a way of perhaps consolidating some of the core transit services, but still providing accessibility to, to critical population groups. And so there are questions about how you get the best out of the two, how you integrate those services. Um, there is, as there always is, a key driver around punctuality and reliability. Um, and there's an understanding that, you know, transit operators still need to get the basics right um, and you know that that comes down to delivering a service on time reliably um, but with resource constraints the question is how how do you how do you hit those punctuality targets how do you how do you how do you deliver a good service when you're also trying to find ways to reduce uh, resource costs and so there's this question then that leads on to that is how can you reshuffle how you can you re reconfigure all the resources you have at your disposal to get the best best outcome um, and and this really boils down to asking some key questions around different parts of the network planning process so if you like an, an, an operator or an authority can start thinking about how they might change the routes that they run um, so that could be something as dramatic as you know ending an entire route or starting a new route but more likely it's uh, reconfiguring the path of a route the sequence of bus stops uh, or even just changing the frequency with which you're running different parts of that route. Um, the frequency itself becomes very, very uh, um, nuanced because you might be changing the frequency of the service at certain times of the day, in certain sections of a route, uh, certain days of the week, and all the decisions you make there um, are going to affect the level of resource you need in order to, to deliver your service. But it's also going to affect the level of demand you have for your service. Um, you can change your timetable so you can keep everything the same as it is, but you can change the way in which you're providing information to, to customers and actually uh, changing the, the actual structure of, of, of the service itself. And then you can change your operations. And in all of those cases, they're all the decisions you make on one are going to have an impact on what, what's possible with the other. Um, you know, the, the efficiencies you can gain from rescheduling your service or changing your timetables are going to change whether you need to change a the frequency of a service or you need to change the routine and vice versa. So really the, the, the challenge is which of these changes in combination is going to lead to the best customer experience within constrained resources. And that's what network planners are really grappling with all the time. You know, how do they make the best combination of changes when they've got lots of levers to pull? um uh when you don't have infinite supply so where we start with this problem is to say that there are there are two ultimately there are two key things that the the operating authorities need to do they need to predict the demand um for for what they're doing and they need to optimize the way in which the supplier is trying to meet that demand um so in, in terms of demand um but we know at the moment that demand is really uncertain. So the long-term patterns around travel behavior is something for which it's, uh, it, it's not really possible uh, to seriously say that we know exactly how uh, patterns are gonna be changing over the long run. Um, we know that there's been a shift away from morning commuting at the moment, as Tim has been saying, how sustained that will be, how dramatic that will be, it's too early to say. We know that there are certain population groups that are more resilient um, in terms of ridership than others. Um, there are more discretionary services that have been, been more affected than, than, than core services that related to kind of the necessity of travel. Um, but what we can do is make the most of uh, the new uh, streams of data that are coming from smart ticketing, mobile apps, um, and 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 the, the ticketing devices on the vehicles to understand what customers are doing at the moment, build up a picture of their behavior. So we can really focus in on um, making small scale changes to the network 
based on very recent data about what people are doing. So, you know, in essence, what you're doing is you say you've got long term uncertainty. So you're trying to focus on what you do know uh, by making changes on the network um, uh, over the short run and then rerunning and rerunning those changes. So the way in which we do that is we bring um, you know, the core data sets we were talking about earlier, like the GPS information, the ticketing information. Um, and when we build out a, a, a kind of a matrix of the origin and destinations of all passengers across a bus network, uh, you're doing that to try and understand not just um, who's on a particular bus at any time, how, how many people are going to be occupying that bus, although that is important, but, but really to understand where do people want to get to um, and how does that change across the day? So you're trying to build up a profile um, of the actual in intent of those journeys. So that's that's been something we've been doing quite a lot over the last couple of years, both from the point of view of, of, of uh, helping operators provide better customer information via apps that you know, help passengers know how busy the bus is going to be, um, but also from the point of view of understanding where there are um, in, you know, real need for, for changes in the schedules and in, in the, um, the, the design of the network. Um, and then the next thing we're doing is we're trying to fuse together uh, recent data from, from novel sources of information with longer term understanding of, um, of elasticities of demand. So different popula population groups, uh, different areas within a city will be more or less sensitive to changes in service frequencies, routing, et cetera, and so forth, uh, because they have either different alternatives um, or, or different necessities, different incomes, et cetera. And so really what you're trying to do is build up a picture of how not just people are currently traveling at the moment, but how they are likely to be affected, or how they're likely to respond to um, the kind of tactical changes you might make down on the ground, such as changing the service frequency or changing the, the, the routing of a, of, of a service. Um, then on the supply side, um, this is one area where we think there's a, there's a real need for operators to uh, really sweat their data to be as efficient as they can so that they can protect uh, service levels. Um, so uh, one thing that we're seeing um, all over all over the country is that there is essentially hidden time and resource within um, existing timetables and schedules. Uh, that there is uh, the, the way in which the, um, the, the scheduling process and the network planning process runs at the moment generates um, services that are uh, uh, in, in many cases, not delivering the traffic commission's 95% target of on-time performance, and at the same time, um, using more resource than is necessary. Um, and so we've been um, applying our technology to try and help operators get the best of both um, when they're making changes on the network. So the kind of effect this has can be quite dramatic. Um, so here, for example, you're looking at changes in on-time performance um, without increasing resource. So uh, where you can see that there's a significant change in the punctuality of the service simply by reshuffling the time you're allocating um, to get from one place to another um, through the bus network. Now that does two things. One, uh, it improves um, customer service and that can be seen through increased boarding rates. Uh, it can be seen through you know, better customer feedback um, because you're delivering a much better service in the first place. And secondly, it speeds up journeys um, and that speeding up journeys can actually save resource uh, rather than cost resource. And what we see is that there are opportunities throughout the way in which timetables and schedules are constructed to actually uh, save, uh, save, uh, save time, save driver time, save vehicle time that can be plowed back um, into the rest of the network. Two minutes, um, Pete. Yeah, sure. So what we've um, what we're doing is we're basically taking all that kind of capability and putting it into a system that helps operators make these design changes in such a way they can play around with um, each of these components that have a have a bearing on uh, the the end result for passengers. So whether it's the design of the routes and the schedules, whether it's the design of the timetable, it's the allocation of vehicles, actually putting those tools in the hands of network planners so they can quickly test these different scenarios. Um, and I think, you know, this is this is where we would see the real need and the real opportunity in the industry at the moment is for faster, um, more frequent 
incremental changes to the network based on data about what is happening over the last few, uh, last few months, weeks, and, um, and, and starting to evolve the network in response to the data that you have available. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you want to know more, just uh, reach out to us, contact at Perspective, or check out the website. Um, and uh, yeah, looking forward to the conversation later. Mm. Thank you, Pete. That was a fascinating um, view of uh, of the world. It's 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 interesting that you've got a, a national model in effect um, as well, and that you can go from that national picture um, all the way down. Um, so uh, yeah, no, very interesting. So um, next we've got um, Dan from Basemap, who's going to talk to us um, about um, what they've been doing. Um, with uh, with network planning. And great, thanks, Tim. Hopefully you can see my screen at the moment. Excellent, thank you very much. Well, thanks for the opportunity to talking today. Um, so I'm Dan Saunders, I'm Head of Products at Basemap. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what we're doing with regards to planning public transport networks. So to talk a little bit about who we are at Basemap, so we were established 22 years ago. Uh, we're a software development company uh, focusing on transportation. Uh, we do a couple of large scale uh, data sets. So the Travel Line National Data Set we do via contract with Travel Line. And um, the National Coach Services Database we do a uh, contract via DFT. And we've run both of these for the last 10 years. So I've been very happy and excited to have done. Uh, with uh, our customer base, we've got customers based in North America across to New Zealand uh, using our track software, which is quite an exciting thing for us, or looking at how they can manage their public transport networks and provide accessibility. And we've got over 800 users doing that as well across central governments, like the Department for Transport, Department for Health, NHS, uh, local governments uh, at uh, county council level and district council level, as well as private sector clients. And they're all using it basically to model how access looks across cities, regions, or nationally. And all this is done with our track software, uh, which was launched in 2013. It's multimodal, so it looks at access via public transport, as well as walking, cycling, and driving. We load in public transport data uh, through GTFS, Trans Exchange, ATCO, SIF, and, and NetEx data we can load in as well now. We load in footpath information and road information showing where people can walk through a network um, as well as drive uh, and interchange between services. We load in points of interest information and demographic data. So points of interest uh, shows people where they might want to access. So schools, libraries, hospitals, things like that. And demographic data could show how many people can get there. Uh, we also, uh, once this data is loaded, we can generate trips against it. So we generate millions of trips based on origins and destinations if we've broken down by modes. Uh, and where we're kind of unique in this is the data can be edited so we can put new footpaths in, new bus routes or bus routes in, uh, we can put in new tram routes and things like that and model how access changes. And the outputs itself are then generated as travel times, travel distances, frequency of services and PTEL scores, so public transport accessibility level. And every calculation that is done can be customised by day, time, uh, day of week and things like that. So effectively we look at a full journey, so we'd look at uh, when you leave the house, which services you use, how long you spend waiting at each service, how long you interchange and how long it takes to get to the destination. Um, and we report this back to the user. So in this example, we'd say they're on a bus for 18 minutes, they're on a train uh, for 20 minutes, and they're on a tram for, um, I can't quite read, but how many minutes was it on the tram? So we can break down journeys by different modes um, as part of it, um, as doing this. So what I'm going to do is talk a few case studies of how it's actually being used in industry. And the first one we've talked about the Department for Transport, um, and this is them taking a national view about how public transport networks are performing um, in the whole country. Um, so what they do is they produce national journey time statistics. These are released annually. The latest one uh, released was 2019. And they look at comparing transport travel times of the network by walking, cycling, driving, and public transport. I've included a couple of images here. Hopefully you can see them, but maybe not depending on the size of your screen, but effectively showing the different kind of destinations that they look like. So they've got employment, primary schools, secondary schools, further education, um, uh, hospitals, food stores, and food stores. And as you can see, uh, public transport always appears as the third best. So driving is always the best, followed by cycling, followed by public transport. And this is done annually, so they can effectively see how the network is performing year on year for the whole country to access these key 
key locations, these key destinations. And this data is made publicly available. You can go on to the DFT website and download all the Journey Time statistics information and was part of it. It's done at output area level, so looking at 180,000 uh, different origin points across the whole of England. And the most detailed destination, I think, is primary schools, there's about 18,000 and they're generating journey times for every single one of those, and uh, then published. The interesting thing here is how urban and rural perform. This is one of the metrics they look at. So generally, to access any one of these destinations by public transport on average is 15 minutes in an urban environment, but in a rural environment, currently uh, pre-COVID, uh, that was 30 minutes. So, uh, other types of clients we've got is local authorities. And what are local authorities are effectively looking at doing with our software is they're looking at monitoring access to key services like the DFT are doing at a national level. This is also being done at a more local level. So what I've got here is three different maps in Cardiff, uh, one of our clients, and they're looking at access to hospitals and GPs, secondary schools and primary schools. And we can see how access for uh, secondary schools is performing the least. Using demographic data, we can show that only 92% of people can get to a secondary school within 20 minutes. Well, something like a primary school is performing much better because it's more often there's more destinations. This is giving a local authority a view of seeing how accessible um, their city is at the moment. And you may have heard the phrase 20 minute cities or 15 minute neighborhoods. That's effectively ensuring that things that you need to access are on your doorstep. And that's exactly what we're looking at here and um, using our track software. What you can then do as well is you can edit the network. So in this example, if they set a criteria, they want to increase 92% and how could you improve it? So you can model putting new bus routes or bus routes in as part of it. It's a bit of a spot the difference uh, here. So here we can see on the left-hand side, the right-hand side, the difference of uh, putting a few new bus routes in and how that improves the network. And we see 4% more of the population can now access a secondary school uh, than previous. Um, and this is a little quote from Cardiff Council, actually saying about how great it is that people are going to explore and uh, making accessible cities. Also, uh, in local authorities, one of our biggest uses of track is looking at new developments. So, as you know, we've got a big kind of crisis of planning at the moment. We need more homes, more affordable homes. And lots of these developments are done in rural areas or areas that may not have a bus route that is currently serving the area right now. So, what it's used quite extensively for is looking at, well, how can we assess this site? Can people get from this site? Is it accessible? Can they get to hospitals? Can they get to GPs and get to food stores without the reliance um, on the car? And by local authorities doing this information, it allows them to use statutory requirements like construction infrastructure levies and section 106s to fund new transport schemes and transport uh, methodologies. And this map is just showing something in Staffordshire, showing 60 minutes access on a Wednesday between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Uh, getting to hospitals. And you can see the overlay of sites. So the blue kind of hashed areas are where there's planned new residential developments. I've been seeing quite a few instances there. They're not covered by public transport at the moment. So what they can effectively do is they can tailor the requirements. So in this example, they wanted to ensure that in an urban area, new developments are in 350 metres of a bus stop or 800 metres in rural areas. These services would allow people to get to key destinations so they wouldn't have to rely on, on the car of using it. They could use the statutory requirements to fund that bus route for a number of years. Though the hope would be that uh, after a certain number of years, it would become commercially viable and so it no longer need to be rely on funding to do that. Or they also, when looking at this, could be used to look at removal of subsidised services. So with cuts in, in, in operating uh, budgets of councils, they've also used to see what happens if you remove uh, budgets as part of it. I've got quite a long quote um, here uh, from someone in Staffordshire uh, County Council, uh, but effectively it's showing how great it was that they were in the driving seat. Uh, they could actually model the new bus routes and services and then put a pressure on developer to fund it um, as well. And they had great evidence base to allow them to do that. So we mentioned COVID earlier on. Uh, so COVID had a real kind of big effect um, on uh, the amount of services that are available to consumers at the moment. Uh, this is some information we looked at for example, look at coach services and how they dropped off with COVID. A uh, number of journeys, which is individual trips, really dropped off when COVID kind of hit in. So the problem is it's increased car-based models and uh, car-based travel as part of it. So what we did is we looked at a region as part of this, we looked at Norfolk, and if you remember I said earlier on that the average rural uh, journeys was 30 minutes uh, to a destination uh, pre-COVID, pre actually that's increased by 30% because actually the, the buses don't exist that were there before. I can highlight that on a couple of maps just here. 
this map is currently showing 60 minutes um, access across the whole of Norfolk. There's no reason I chose Norfolk more than it was the first bit of data I came across. And this is showing 60 minutes bus and uh, walking and train access to hospitals across the whole of Norfolk. This next screen here shows uh, the current view from the data before Omicron. So October, if I just jump between the two, you can see many rural areas are no longer accessible as they were previously. We start tying this into demographic data, and we can see that in January 2020, before COVID hit, 83% of residents are within a 60 minute bus and train commute uh, to get to a hospital for an outpatient appointment. That's now dropped to 71.9% pre Omicron. So, giving that evidence based and looking at that map, you can work out where maybe investment or change to the network needs to be completed. So, when you look at improving access to the network or changing the network, uh, within track you can put in new bus routes this is some work in oxfordshire uh, looking at putting a new service uh, running to whitney community hospital uh, running from a local station uh, they also made some changes to the walking aspect of the site making it more accessible by walking and cycling as well this is current access times to whitney uh, showing up to 45 minutes uh, they've overlaid in this instance some uh, outpatient uh, appointment centers uh, locations where people travel from and staff members to get an idea of where people are traveling to to get to that site as well and it gives you kind of an idea of where you've got good access or poor access within 45 minutes at the moment then what they did is they modeled two new stops just a literal uh, location going from whitney hospital to the station they created two new nap towns as part of this it was a six mile route in total to do that or 9.8 kilometers they used uh, speed data uh, from vehicles some gps vehicles to work out it'll be a 13 minute uh, journey uh, during the off-peak actually wasn't much different in the peak as well and they decided they wanted to do a half hourly service would give a, a one peak vehicle requirement so they created the route they created the timetable uh, running uh, every third every, every half hour being a 30 minute run time and did it in both directions as well and this allowed them then to model the current and the after so you can see now where the route's been created and we can now see around woodstock uh, to the east and northeast and we can see the improved accessibility and we can then see the bus routes uh, that actually feed the station already to the east actually then being able to pick up this service as well so we can see the improvement in access across the region that was it really just a quick, quick whistle stop tour of, uh, of ourselves on the track so as i said to conclude i think the big thing of track is to ensure that cities and regions remain accessible for residents and ensure they've got a choice of using public transport and not forced to use the car New development to make sure it's accessible and that uh, local authorities should use these uh, funding uh, laws to, to fund these services as well. Uh, and they can use it to plug any gaps, the subsidised services or DRT services as part of it as well. And also we've seen that many local authorities are monitoring access annually to see how the network is performing. As many buses are privatised, they have no control of how they're doing. They still have a statutory regulation to ensure that people can get to supermarkets or get to hospitals or healthcare or education. Um, so yeah, that's to kind of conclude. Um, and if you want to get in contact, here's some various contact details of me at the bottom. So yeah, no, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Um, very interesting um, to see how um, the, the the routes and timetables are used from a from a more strategic planning um, perspective. Um, so yeah, no, very good, and uh, uh, we'll pick up on uh, on some of those things in the discussion, um, no doubt. Um, so go from um, Dan looking at, uh, at the strategic uh, high level networks and um, um, the, that sort of overall accessibility design. Um, we've now got Aidan and Mark from EPM who. Um, uh, are going to look at it more from a uh, from a from a service and a and a network public transport pure perspective. Thank you, Tim. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming along to listen to us all today. Uh, so my name is Aidan Proctor. I'm the product owner for the scheduling suite of software at Omnibus, and my colleague Mark Jones is with us as well, and he's the product owner for the EPM suite of software. Uh, EPM and Omnibus together are part of the EPM group of companies. So most of you, I'm sure, will already be familiar with Omnibus, uh, widely regarded as the market leading solution for uh, scheduling software in the UK bus industry. And EPM software is, is also uh, well known and widely regarded as the leading supplier of operational 
and analysis tools throughout the UK bus industry. And both companies have uh, a wide range of customers across the UT, UK LTA sector and customers across the world. So the two, com the two businesses uh, complement each other very well. And together, uh, the, two, the two suites of uh, software manage the flow of data from planning through operation to analysis and then feeding that data back into the planning process. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so since becoming uh, part of the same company last year, we've been doing a lot of work to streamline uh, workflows and business practices uh, where the two systems interact. Um, hopefully you will have seen the press release recently about Mersey Travel. So I'll use those as a, a quick example. They are, they're a long-standing customer of, of EPM and are now in the process of adopting our cloud-based scheduling solution, which means that we're able to streamline the process of creating timetables and maps for contracts uh, by feeding schedules directly into their contracts register, saving them duplication of data entry. So bringing the two systems together also means that our software holds a vast amount of really useful data that can be used to analyze services, analyze service performance and network performance. So it presents the opportunity to analyze a wide range of data at all levels of the business in a way that just wasn't previously possible. So I'm going to let Mark take you through some of those, um, some of those possibilities. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, can you still hear me? Hopefully so. Yes. Yep. He nods. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope you're all well. Um, as Aidan said, I'm Mark from the product team at EPM. And this afternoon, I'd just like to briefly show you some of the work we've been doing with operators, uh, local authorities, and devolved um, governments as well across the UK um, using our software packages. Um, I'll be showing a few examples from our Insights product, uh, which we've been developing over the last couple of years. Um, and this is one of many of our uh, cloud-based products. <clears throat> so uh, here at EPM, we're, we've got a range of products to help uh, quickly understand the changes of the network uh, and to look at the impact to the business. Um, we want to work with you uh, and allow you to, to plan for future changes. We import a range of external data sources automatically into the system, and that ranges from schedules, uh, our own omnibus uh, schedules, but we also work with all uh, schedule providers to import data uh, for the operators and the local authorities. We bring in the revenue streams from uh, smart ticketing and off-bus apps as well, and we combine it with our own data, uh, for example, concessionary data or contracting information, and we apply a route viability model to the data set. So when we're looking at the network, we're looking at the performance of that network as well. What's the impact for the bus operation? The results from the viability algorithm are presented to operators, which allow them to quickly look at KPI metrics and identify areas of concern. I think as Tim said at the start of the process as well of the discussion, this data will soon become available to local authorities as well, as they uh, have access to patronage data and fare data that can help uh, look at their network as a whole. Uh, the demo page I'm showing here is designed for commercial teams within a bus operation to look at a high level overview of the network and identify trends uh, and issues quickly. And we can drill into that further as well. So utilizing data, we can look at periodic trends and visualize comparisons of the data. For example, we can take the passenger and revenue data or metrics from our viability model and present that back to the commercial and planning teams. We're looking at what's happened in the past and using that to inform on future demand for the future network. We can look here at um, on and off bus revenue uh, in this example across the services and looking how they're differing over time and look at trends. One route may be performing much better than another and start to drill down and investigate that. 
all our routes are going to see growth, uh, recovery or decline as a result of COVID. And we want to investigate that and use the data to look at the impact. At EPM, we have a contract performance module, and that's used by both operators and local authorities to manage contract compliance. It looks at customer utilization of the routes and generate operator payments as well. And by integrating with the Omnibus products, um, the data we've obtained and the data we've obtained in the contracts module, our customers are very keen to look at the changes in demand and the impact at service, trip and stop level. So in this example, I've got uh, for my demo bus company in Bromsgrove, we've um, drilled in through to the trips uh, and we can see the tendered services uh, at stop level. And we can look at the passenger uh, patronage across the week and the visualization tools within Insights are useful to quickly identify passenger trends by day, time band and location. And with tap on tap off schemes as well, we can look at that uh, transfer of passages through the network and look at their trends uh, throughout the day. And it gives a new dimension to the data. We can use the Insights tool to drill down further uh, and look at stop level data. So at the start, we looked at uh, the performance of the network as a whole, and now we can start to look at stops uh, and look at the network and the timetable and the scheduling of that network. For instance, we can see two stops will have a, a potentially have a, a dwell time, historically may have served patronage and maybe through decline and changes in the network, we can identify uh, possible changes for improvements or efficiencies that can be made in the network. We're seeing rapid changes to both social infrastructure and mobility, and the team at EPM are, are really helping uh, local authorities and operators identify these trends uh, and using insights as that tool to, um, to assist with that. I'll go back to you, Aidan. Right, thank you, Mark. Um, Yes, yeah, so as, as Mark has, has covered, we've got our insights tool, which is capable of aggregating data from multiple sources and for local authorities, uh, as Mark said, from multiple operators. So you can get that holistic network view. Schedulers and planners can then use that data that they've analysed and, and feed that directly back into their next review, uh, network review. So as I mentioned uh, previously, We've already sort of started streamlining processes. Uh, we talked about Mersey travel and, and contracts. We're, we're going to now be streamlining the process of getting that analyzed data, feeding that straight back into our timetabling software. And so we're flowing that straight back through into the planning process. And there's already tools existing in that uh, scheduling software that en enable you to very quickly analyze the impact of timetable changes in terms of vehicles and hours um, that's all i wanted to say so um thank you very much for listening everybody i'll uh, pass you back to tim yep thank you aiden thank you mark um it's uh it, it's fascinating to to see the the level of detail that you could that you can get to help with the with the detailed route um uh, efficiency that, uh, that that you've got access to um, there. Um, we will now um, move on to um, for for some the new kid on the block, I guess, um, with Optibus, um, who um, are going to um, talk to us about uh, what they've been doing um, recently. And that that's very literally, I think, Tim. So I'm on day eleven. Um, <laughs> up to us on the fourth of January. Um, my name is John Usher. I'm the, um, the the partnerships director for cities um, at Optibus, and Craig is going to be my sidekick, straight driving the presentation today. Craig, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, um, everyone. Some of you know you very well. I'm Craig Nelson from Optibus. I'm VP of Sales for Cities. Um, really pleased to be here. Thanks for organising, Tim. Yeah. So over me to do the to to do the kind of intro to us. And I think we've been teed up really nicely by um, by by the other presentations this afternoon. So, uh, I mean, Tim, you've already 
said that you know the last 20 months have been incredibly challenging for the industry um you know you've been at the cold face of the global pandemic but there's also been this root and branch um change in the policy framework that's underpinned your operations uh, you know during the same period um I'm, I'm very conscious that we've only got really short period um with you this afternoon but we'd just like to look at the future to look at how optibus can be the partner that helps you not to not only deal with the upheaval that you're facing but look at um how our platform can help with achieving and measuring the success the government is seeking through the bus service improvement plans um so really quickly um for those that don't know us as, as tim said we're relatively newcomers on the block we're only four years old as an organization um but here's an introduction to to optibus um so we're we're cloud native um a service is a, a, a software as a service platform um we work with operators and local authorities um and, and crucially enabling collaboration between the two which is a a key feature of the bsips and and enhanced partnerships that you're all entering into um and because we're in the cloud we're always updating the system it's a continuous rollout of new features that kind of arrive every every quarter and six months um and and i'll leave it to craig to kind of go through the those features in the platform itself um a, a little bit later but those a lot of those features have been um, developed uh with our customers and alongside customers um and to give you just a really quick sense of scale, Optibus is, is currently deployed in over 500 cities worldwide and, and 30 of those are planning authorities, um, as well as working with major operators, including First um, Stagecoach and, and Arriva Group. Um, so our end to end platform is split into modules and, and you effectively get to choose which um, are relevant to your operation. But for the purposes of, of today, we'll concentrate on on the planning side. Um, uh, and, and Craig will talk us through the tools. But thinking about the, the BSIP um, challenges and, and just looking at how we think we can help you because um, you've been asked to deliver an, a, a huge amount over the last um, kind of nine to 12 months um, in such a short amount of time. Um, now, you've been asked to, to set targets for journey times and we think our, our powerful analytics can help you to improve um, kind of simple KPI reporting against your BSIP targets um, that saves you time and effort. Um, we've got a new running time prediction engine that will highlight sections of routes where vehicles are getting stuck in general traffic, um, helping to prioritize infrastructure investment. We've also got an EV module, which can help to optimize um, how fleets are run with electric vehicles in mind, um, taking into account vehicle charging requirements and helping you on that journey of transport decarbonization. Um, it's possible to add demographic data into our planning tools um, and using detailed analytics to provide accurate reports, uh, but also identify opportunities for, for passenger growth. And, and our mapping tool based on, on kind of Google Maps engine is it's possible to pull in other transport data as well into that via different GIS layers. So for instance, um, one of the requirements of the BSIP is to think about multimodal journeys and you know, could you be looking at where your um, LC whip um, routes and, and nodes are are taking passengers to plan for end to end journeys? Um, so we'll start going into more detail on some of the features of the strategic planning tools. Um, so it's high level, um, but just because of the time we've got. But um, hopefully there'll be time at the end of the presentation to um, yeah to get dug into questions. So over to you, Craig. Thanks, John. Um... Thanks, John. You've only been here a week and a half. That's your first presentation. I think you do a great job. Um, I'm going to take over the reins of talking a little bit about uh, about the product. Um, three main areas. Um, I'm going to talk about occupancy, planning based on occupancy, occupancy and demand. This is something that Pete, I think, teed this up very nicely. Uh, it's I'm glad that we have product fit. I, <laughs> it's definitely something which uh, customers are looking for. Um, we're also going to look at how real time data is being used in planning, and also uh, cost models as well. So to start off, um, I'm going to look at how uh, planning can be uh, based on occupancy data um, and demand. So there's lots of needs here and we've talked about these and everyone has touched on these. So matching supply um, to the actual uh, passenger demand, um, important across both PTOs and PTAs, um, especially around collaboration with BSIPs. Um, predicting passengers, again, we've talked about that. Um, on particularly on the on a given network and also right down to the root level. Um, Optibus is you know a native cloud native platform. It's very fast. You can 
you can really spin up scenarios very quickly. There's something which our operator uh, customers really like is you can create schedules and, and new plans very fast and compare them, get them in front of the public, get them in front of um, counselors, et cetera. Very shareable because it's web-based. Um, and also just do a deep dive into into revenue analysis. And again, something which uh, the guys at EPM uh, nicely drilled into that how, how important that is. So how do we do this? We've got a number of tools, uh, which we call impact analysis, which is right in the planning module. But again, because we're an end-to-end -end platform, um, all of this, if you make any changes at this level, it all syncs with the scheduling piece um, uh, and where necessary through to rostering and operations as well. Um, but we're looking here at GIS data. A lot of local authorities have tons of GIS data. You can pull this in and you can look at equity. So where are people uh, from different backgrounds living? Um, how is transport serving, serving them? Um, and if you do change a route, um, how will they be impacted? So the screens here are pretty simple. They show KPIs um, uh, and actively update as you as you update the route, um, change the uh, route geography, that type of thing. Um, we're also looking at ridership analysis and also projected revenue. So review all your ridership and crowding data again on the on the planning layer. This is something which uh, it's really great to see across all all presentations that uh, you know map based planning tools are so popular now that very usable people recognize them and surfacing this data and it, and it does exist and this again has come up get it into these platforms understand where you've got low performing routes where you can adjust to meet demand um, and again make it shareable and make it really accessible if you're collaborating with your operator or your uh, PTA um, uh, partner. Um, you can look at pricing models per day, um, and look at projected revenue at the network level, um, and importantly, again, I'm underpinning this to complete the full picture. So it's it's uh, it's full circle. Um, Aidan was talking about this. So you you plan, you uh, an analyze, you adjust, and then what actually happens. Um, and was it impactful? Did it make a difference? Uh, can you can you rejig it? Can you be agile to make sure that you know you, you you're capturing the the revenue that you need um, uh, and at specific times of the day? So this full this idea of a full picture I think is super important, and I'm really pleased that we've all talked about this today. So costs, um, something we talked to to Tim about, and something which we've been speaking a lot to our operator and partners about, um, establishing cost at the planning level. And you know, we we're talking to Tim about um, you know BSIPs. It's it's really, I mean, I, I'd be quite excited to build a new new network, but if it's going to cost you know 200 buses to run a a small network, uh, it's going to be expensive. So how can you how can you plan and and keep track of of costs? So when you're planning, you need to understand um, operational costs, and even if you're a um, a local authority, it's um, and you're working as part of a BSIP. It's really good to know. Okay, so we're <laughs> we're planning this, but how's it going to hit hit the operators? And um, so again, as you're adding routes, adjusting routes, you're adjusting your frequencies. Um, you get a, a preliminary um, analysis of cost and PVR, so how many vehicles are required. Um, and as you adjust the frequencies, work with your partners to understand how that impacts it. It surfaces um, uh, very quickly, building scenarios. Um, so yeah, you get this upfront idea of how much it's going to cost um, before building the full timetable. So this stage becomes before our um, core um, timetable um, build. Um, it's that preliminary um, idea of you know before I really dive deep into the into the dark art of timetabling, what is this um, going to cost me? And again, you can save as you can save this this view, um, set up in a scenario, run them in tabs, and, and compare the two. Um, this is. Uh, one area which is really of great interest to me, um, I used to work for Artig. Uh, I'm, I've been involved with real-time data pretty much all my career. Um, and uh, this is one of the areas I've been helping drive within um, Optibus is how can we make use of all that wonderful real-time data that uh, sits in silos but has you know, recently become available via BODs? How can we, how can we do this to create timetables which reflect the, the real world? So how can you plan um, using uh, real world data um, that reflects road conditions. So John was talking about pinch points. Where are these pinch points happening between timing points and stops? And uh, can we create um, timetables that um, that reflect this? So we have a we have a couple of tools um, which uh, we are um, uh, making available. Um, the first one is called our running time prediction engine. So this basically tells you and gives you scores on how well you've built your timetable. So it knows your um, uh, on-time performance goals, 
um, your metrics um, for each uh, route or trip, um, and it will tell you the likelihood of that trip hitting the OTP target um, based on the timetable which is currently in the system. And what it will tell you is where you need to adjust. Um, and it's pulling in um, your OTP goals. So you can punch in your goals and then it will pull in historic AVL data for a particular route to, um, to produce um, trip times, which reflect um, and, and we've, we've heard a lot about this. So reflecting what's happening in the real world um, and presenting um, trip times, which um, make the passenger more confident that their bus is actually going to arrive. So improving the overall service. service. And then from there, once you're happy, you can then push that to the, the scheduling tool, which then pushes down to the rostering and then uh, gets delivered on, on the ground. So that's our um, running time prediction engine, um, which again can be used as this idea of strategic planning right at the start. And then the, the other tool we have is, is optimizing timetables. So um, prim primarily, this is to reduce costs um, and to manage offsets. So optimizing your timetable to effectively reduce the number of vehicles require um, whilst meeting the, the frequency needs. Um, you can adjust these or make recommendations. Um, it takes guessing out of it. Um, and as you change and as you update, uh, and also you can put in your OTP goals, and it can also bring in your OTP data um, via the um, AVL flow. So it knows how well you're doing and maybe how you need to adjust. Um, works very well with the runtimes um, tool. Um, so you can adjust and all the KPIs are reflected and you can look at the impact on PVR, um, vehicle efficiency um, and, and overall total costs. And if you remember right, right at the front, um, you can relate it back to all of those strategic planning tools on the map, um, all of those adjustments you've made. So how can you improve it further? So um, that was a, a, a brief canter through you know, what we're working on at the moment, what we have and, and what we're doing, mainly with the um, PTO and PTA in mind um, around strategic planning. John, I think you were going to wrap up for us. I'm off mute just to say thank you ever so much for, for, for listening. Um, you know, do, um, do check us out, have a look at the website, do get in touch if there's any questions that you, you don't feel comfortable asking here but, um, but want to drop us a line. Um, we do have a newsletter as well, so if there's, um, yeah, if you've got an opportunity to just check out the website and sign up. Um, that's, that's all from us. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you, John. Thank you, Craig. Um, that uh, looks a, uh, a very interesting um, set of tools that uh, that you've got. Um, next sort of um, bit is um, questions. So <coughs> we've, we've covered um, quite a range of things, everything from the very detailed um of of a of a timetable all the way up to accessibility um so please do feel free to ask um our experts who probably know how to do these things if you don't and have got any questions um stephen has um asked a question thinking as a from a, as a commercial operator or an authority with no new money um, that's probably everybody. Um, can demand responsive transport ever improve the financial performance of a network? Um, pretty much everybody's talk, been talking about fixed route um, and timetable services. What about demand responsive? How would that play into um, this? And have you got any thoughts about the financial performance, anybody? I'm happy to say a couple of things about that, Tim. If... Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's a good question, and it's certainly a pertinent one because BSIPs are making a big, um, big thing of, around the potential of DRT, um, and it's certainly something that um, PTOs and PTAs need to take seriously and have been. Um, there have been a number of um, stops and starts around the growth of DRT in the UK, and I think that really it boils down to the commercials. You know, is there are there ways to get a service going and then and then scale? Um, in a way that um, uh, doesn't require excessive subsidy, um, and I think one of the one of the things that we're seeing happen uh, recently is the, is a better better degree of integration in the planning around scheduled and DRT services, which um, could make a big difference around their commercial viability. Um, if you think of a DRT service as a discrete service uh, that has to run and um, justify itself commercially in every single case, um, then there probably 
are going to be conditions in urban areas where that can happen but there'll be many communities where drt may be a useful service but that needs to be uh, thought of as either requiring subsidy or to be thought of as something that is seen in the round as part of a business case for both high frequency services that that drt uh, feeds so this idea of thinking of drt as a feeder service for um uh, the kind of higher frequency, more profitable services um, run on the scheduled network um, enables you to think of DRT perhaps in a context where um, it's it's part of a, a wider business case, uh, and I think that's that's where there's a lot of potential for for uh, um, providing those kinds of core services in conjunction with the with the rest of the network. Um, I think that's that's what we're seeing anyway. I don't know if anyone else is seeing something similar. Um, yeah, I could, I could jump in if you want. So this is stuff yep. that was done in, in Suffolk a while ago, where they removed some of their fixed route scheduled services to replace it with DRT services, just because they didn't have the patronage to justify a fixed route service. Um, and so yes, they put in these DRT services, and sometimes they'd feed a specific destination, such as a hospital or a school pickup service or or something like that. And sometimes they'd feed a, a bus a route that had a high frequency service and that worked quite well. But in my example there, the, the local authority had to fund it the whole time because it never became commercially viable to run by itself. It was always reliant on external funding by the local authority. So I think it's a bit of a million dollar question how you make it work at the moment. But in the Norfolk map that I showed previously, you saw massive gaps in fixed routes, uh, dropping accessibility in rural areas. Well, DRT is a, a prime candidate to, to plug those holes, but it's yet trying to make sure they, they can last without excessive funding by the local authority. Yeah, and the, the the other examples that are more recent that that they're, they're all just being introduced now. So um Lincolnshire are busy um starting to um reintroduce demand response, even semi flexible services for those that have been around a few years. Um 15, 20 years ago there was a concept of a of a of a part fixed route, part flexible based on demand. Um, we're starting to see those sort of things being reintroduced, but it's still a bit early days, I think, to to, to know whether they get commercially viable um, in the long run um, or whether you know, actually the cost of running those um, is low enough to justify the authority run, you know, funding them from a from a, a an accessibility point of view um, to get those people to um, the destinations that they need. Um, and I think the interesting play, I think, is it? I think it might be Wiltshire that that's looking at it um, with and and comparing it with um, patient transport and community transport services, um, and and how the two sort of trade off. Um, so, uh, so I think you know, give give it a year or so, we might know a bit more. Um, <laughs> so, um, has anybody else got any questions? Don't be shy. One of the things that struck me from from all of the presentations um, was we're looking at um, analysing accessibility and performance um, on on routes, and you can play with those routes and see the effect um, that that has. Um, but how does an operator or an authority go about? identifying at the moment where customers want services um where there's going to be demand um given that it's you know changed from two or three years ago how do we go about get, getting that data to know where people might want services in advance dan uh, yeah uh, so we see some interesting work being done by clients using mobile phone data so uh, actually using an OD analysis you can get from a mobile phone, working out where uh, trips are starting, where they're going to. 
And actually the data is some companies out there now that are trying to work out what mode was used to do that travel. Um, so is it motorized, non-motorized? We then see people say, well, actually, we think a lot of people using the car going from this location to this location using the mobile phone data. Is there an opportunity there to promote a modal shift? Um, so that type of stuff's really good. And we see it for mobile phone data and in-app data as well. So actually a new thing we've seen in the last 12 months is people doing hidden things in applications that are always tracking where you're going on iPhones and Android devices, and then selling that data on, say, so got information about the demographic, who you are, what your interests are, potential guessing what your disposable income is and things like that. And then be able to sell that data on to operators or people out to work, or actually, we think there's a business case here of getting running a bus route going from this location to another location. That's one thing. And also the healthcare service, we've seen some work that's done in Southampton where they put a new bus route on, looking at where outpatients were coming, where they're traveling from, using patient records as part of that. And they're actually able to fund a new bus route as part of them became commercially viable within two years, based on using that data and working out where services were running, were not running. But that was a partnership between the NHS and a bus operator to, to get that service kind of uh, off the ground. So yeah, that was a, another interesting use of using a patient and, and staff location data to work that out. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. If you weren't paranoid about what your mobile phone was doing beforehand, maybe you are now. <laughs> there, anybody else? I, mean, I think I would probably just add something similar to what I was saying before, which is, you know, at a time when um, we no one really has any uh, clarity as to what the, the, the kind of the more stable position will be around demand from different groups from different neighborhoods over the long run at the moment, because things are changing month by month. Um, network planners still have to make decisions right now, though, and they're still having to make uh, you know calls about how to adjust the network. But I think there is this point around um, speeding up the the i think what you know you you're referring to craig is like this like full cycle process of um making a decision making an adjustment viewing the impact down on the ground and repeating you know, so that you've got this sense that um the, the network planning process is not uh one where you have to make all the decisions up front and then you know um you, you know you place your cards and then and and i hope it works out it's one where it's you know, a more continuous process where you're using uh, data from the recent past to inform the decisions you're making, um, and then using evidence from uh, the impact that you've had to inform the next round of changes that you're making. So you gradually move to a new network structure rather than make all the decisions in one go. Um, and so it's it's more a continuous process. And I think that that is something that would be you know, a strength for the industry over the long run, even at a time when there, there's more stability around travel demand. Uh, but at the moment, I think it's probably the sensible course to take is to is to work incrementally towards changes on the network. I think the current period has been a you know it's a transport planners nightmare, isn't it? Um, where we've had a collapse of uh, kind of fixed route journeys or, or the ability to provide for fixed journeys. You know the 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 nine to five commuting pattern being completely disrupted. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're certainly in in, in my city in Bristol, a, a, a almost a continuous peak throughout the day. We're not seeing the, you know, the kind of rabbit ears as we used to see uh, of a morning and afternoon peak. It's just a, a steady stream of, of high levels of car traffic um, as things currently stand. And, and journey patterns have become a lot more messy um, over the last 20 months of people making much, far more far greater number of car journeys to more dispersed um destinations from home and and those are incredibly difficult to intercept um you know so when we're thinking about how we're designing our networks we've got to we've really got to be thinking not just about the the journeys in and out of of city centers but but really importantly to to other destinations you know those orbital trips that um that are to school to to the shops to the retail parks that that have been poorly served by public transport in the past. Aidan, have you started to see anything happening with contracts that, that you've got in your system with authorities for, you know, changing things and, and renegotiating things? Are you seeing more activity and that sort of thing as, as we come out? I can jump in. 
from the EPM part, sorry. Um, yeah, we, we're certainly seeing local authorities seeing their their purses uh, tighten even further and um, wanting to react to that. And the way they do that at the moment is to review the networks, look at patronage um, uh, and the impact on those routes uh, and see what is viable, what have they been paying for in the past that um, maybe isn't being supported anymore uh, and, and what they need to do about it. I think also with that data as well, with the ticket machine data, it's useful to to look at patronage with tap on tap off technology. You can see, you remember you got that 75, 70 percent of patronage is, is back. That's still a very large number of those passengers. Are we still serving those correctly? Are they able to make multiple trips to to get from A to B or A to C? Um, so looking at our existing user, our existing customers is is, is very useful and powerful as well. Um, so I think yeah. Um, I think nationally as well, um, supported networks are, are going to have a big spotlight on them, and they're going to have to have the tools that we've all talked about today to be able to do, to react to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important do we think the um, multimodal? Um, for for planning is going to be so we've got Dan who can look at you know walking and and the transition to to to, to trains and trams and 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 buses um, as as we move forward do we need to to think as a public transport industry more about how we bring some of that into play. Um, and and how 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 would we go about that? I mean, Tim, we're, John, and I are in Bristol at the moment, and there's a lot of, as you know, it's a big cycling town. There's a lot of scooters as well, and there's about to be um, electric bike share. And I think it would be a real weakness if uh, we, as a as a as a country, as software providers, as local authorities, weren't weren't planning for you know, multiple modes, including new mobility. I think it's called, still called that, but, you know, scooters and, and DRT. So so tools will need to adapt and you'll be able, you should be able to uh, look at not just passenger um, figures for buses, but for multiple modes. Um, a lot of these uh, new mobility companies have APIs. It can be integrated. I guess that's the easy bit, but what do you do with it next? Um, how do you model it? Um, and I can't see you know, any of us here um, that have presented why we, we can't move into that area and start looking at how we can start planning for, for multiple modes, including interchanges. How does rail fit in as well? We haven't mentioned that, um, including light rail. Um, that I, Tim, that's one, I think it's really exciting. And and I know that as a company, we it's on our radar, and I'm sure it's on everyone's radars, that we, we, we haven't called, called Optibus, but we have to start looking at different modes because ultimately we're trying to optimize the passenger journey be it on a scooter or, or a bus um or a shared vehicle so yeah and i have no real answer but it, it has to happen and it's something which we're definitely going to be considering i mean I, I would agree with everything that greg's just said there and i think um the you know the advantage of having you know, the kinds of software that we've been talking about um available is that you can um, start to make those improvements, start to integrate those new modes, new data sets uh, kind of continuously. Um, so you get the kind of the benefit of the new data streams as they come on board. And I think that there's an opportunity to think multimodally, not just from the point of view of um, strategic changes in route configurations or serving configurations, but just making basic things like um, uh, timetables align. Um, you know, thinking thinking as through multiple services, let alone multiple modes, is something that's, that we need more of. Uh, so that you know, when you arrive at one stop on one service, it aligns with uh, your departure from another service, uh, whether that's um, across modes or even within the same mode. So um, there's certainly a lot of advantage to using all these new data sets to actually just do the basics with the understanding of uh, the wider network. Um, and uh, that's something we certainly take uh, very seriously when you know, providing scheduling software, we're providing scheduling software that enables you to look at how aligned you are beyond the bounds of your own organization. Um, and uh, you know, while, you know, perhaps, you know, the industry is some way 
away at the moment from having a kind of an all singing or dancing multimodal uh, planning system. There's certainly a lot that can be done right now to improve um, just the incremental changes to the way in which uh, timetables and schedules are put together. I think that's a really key point. I think something interesting was done a few years ago. There was a funding called a local sustainable transport fund that lots of local authorities applied the funding for. It was amazing how many of the applications were improving cycle routes and walking routes to stations uh, or over barriers of accessibility, such as railway lines or rivers and things like that. And we saw many people improve cycling and walking access to bus depots and things like that. But I think sometimes you, people get very thought about actually you know, once you're on the bus but we need to think about how do people get to that bus stop how do people interchange between the services that's where micro mobility of e-scooters you know, whether you like them or hate them or Boris bikes or Santander bikes or whatever whatever they're called now how these kind of fit into into the scheme actually if someone can cycle to a bus depot actually you're much increasing your reach of, of where people can access and if they can lock up their bike securely at that location and come back to it later on that really aids people using them transport modes but as a consumer who someone uses public transport i don't really care what 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 service i'm using as long as i can get from a to b and if i need to get a bus or a train to do it actually i'm more concerned about the time it takes and the cost it takes to do it more than the mode of transport and i, I think that's something that we need to make more of a, maybe take more of a holistic view um over i remember lstf dan god that's going back a bit yeah, it's not that. I, I, not I think that it was like okay. but maybe it's longer than that. Who knows? <laughs> so you're completely right in terms of people being, um, you know, ideally we want them to be mode agnostic, don't we? We want them to choose the best mode for the best for the right circumstances, um, you know. And it, and if we can provide a good enough service for them, then then they will be that, you know. And the trends are that you know the younger people are are that, you know, they're they're. They're digital natives. They they do their planning in a Google map, um, and as long as Google map is telling them the right information, then um, then yeah, they're likely to um, you know to to use the mode that, that Google serves them, um, as long as it's reliable enough. Yeah, I feel like I probably ought to say other ma mapping services are available. Um, <laughs> Open street map. But, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um... <laughs> Thank you um, for that um, discussion and conversation. Um, we don't appear to have a very talkative um, audience. Um, so um, <laughs> I'm going to um, <laughs> wrap up um, <laughs> from here. So uh, thank you to everybody um, for attending. Thank you to Pete, Dan, Aidan, Mark, Craig and John for um, presenting um, and um, getting involved in the discussion. Um, I hope you've found it useful. Um, we will circulate the slides around later. So speakers, can you let me have them, please? Um, and um, you'll get uh, all the contact details. Um, they are a very nice, helpful bunch, so please do feel free to get in touch with them and ask them questions. Um, likewise, um, if you want to know more about um, Artig, details will be on the screen in a minute. Um, we have um, a, another webinar um, in a few weeks' time on the 3rd of February to launch um, a report that we've just um, produced um, on passenger counting and the different technologies um, and how they work. Um, so please uh, do um, sign up. Um, if you're not an Artig member, there's a little small um, charge um but um hopefully you'll find that um value for money anyway um and um if you want to get in touch with me um find out more about artig or any the other rest of the team then um details are on the screen um thank you again for attending thank you again to all of the speakers um hope you have a good rest of the day Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk.
Thank you. Thank you.